Central Church. I would like to welcome you to today's uh, presentation of our Goodbye Disease Seminar. I'd also like to welcome those of you that are joining us this evening on all our online platforms. We pray that you've been having a good time on the past four days that we've had uh, sessions and we hope that you'll stay for the rest of the evening today to get uh, more information about the disease that we are talking about today. Our presentations are being given to us by Pastor Arnold Neuhoff, who is coming to us from South Africa. Pastor Neuhoff has an amazing wife called Edna and two adult children that are both married. His son, Pierre, lives with his wife, Tegan, in Uppington, and his daughter, Masan, lives in Parklands with Wesley and her 10-month-old son, Liam. So Pastor Arnold is a happy Upa. Yes, that's Grandpa. Pastor Neuhoff graduated with a Bachelor of Theology and started a ministerial career 35 years ago. After getting a terminal di uh, cancer diagnosis in 1997, he totally recovered by God's grace and by following different health principles that he discovered. So, following that, he now specializes in teaching and presenting natural health and disease uh, prevention programs to people all over the world. He is involved with many NGOs that are aimed at helping communities live healthier lives and to avoid disease. Pastor Arnold is also the presenter of a few other programs including the popular series called Brain Power Seminars. You can join this, um, or you can watch the Brain Power Seminars by joining the WhatsApp group. The link for the WhatsApp group is available on the YouTube notice, the Facebook platform, and also in the notice for the uh, program on the Zoom channel. So if you want to watch the 13-part Brain Power series, please join the WhatsApp group that has been formed so that you can get access to this uh, uh, series. There's also something special for all those that are going to register. Pastor Arnold has a special gift, so please do register so that you can get this special gift. To start off our presentation this evening, I'll invite all of us to now pray, and after that, uh, Pastor will stand to speak to us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for being with us today. We thank you, Lord, for being with us during this week that has passed. We thank you for the opportunities that we've had to serve you and to work for you. We pray, Lord, also to thank you for Pastor Arnold that has traveled to help us understand things that you have revealed to him. We pray, Father in heaven, that what we've heard will not just be something that uh, stays uh, without being uh, practiced, but we pray that you give us the will and the power to do your will for us in our lives. We thank you for those people that are joining us on the online platforms, some for the first time today. We pray, Lord, that because of their joining, they'll learn something that will make them healthier and want to serve you even more. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of the Sabbath that is upon us now, and we pray that you give each of us the extra blessings that you've placed on the Sabbath, that we may truly rest, and by resting we may be drawn closer to you. As we uh, continue worshiping you this evening, we pray, Lord, that you accept our worship and that you give us uh, clear thoughts and understanding. And we also pray for Pastor Arnold that you continue to speak to him and through him to us. In Jesus' name we pray all this. Amen. Thank you for that introduction. 
Um, and I want to, from my side, when I want to welcome you uh, to this very special occasion as well. I need to just share with you once again the, the disclaimer um, that uh, what follows in this presentation is not designed to be medical advice at all. Information is to provide, uh, it's provided on, on scientific uh, research and um, as well as from practical experience. And so just uh, look at the rest of my disclaimer so that uh, there's no confusion at, at any point. Well, there's uh, been some more questions. Um, <clears throat> I've got a question here, a very interesting one that says, uh, insomnia is fairly common. What is the cure? So, you know, insomnia is uh, if, if, if there's disturbance in sleep. So, um, what is some of the things that, that causes us not to sleep well? Um, well, I'm going to give you at least seven pointers, but there, sh there could be more. Now, I've not put it on the screen. I'm just going to give it to you from the cuff. Eating late at night is going to cause you not to sleep well. I'm not going to go into all the detail why. Um, if, if, if you want more detail on that, if there's a problem and you need more information, I can maybe tomorrow afternoon speak about that. Uh, a pH acid um, that's too high, levels that are too high in the system, that would cause you not to sleep well. If you're constipated, you're not going to sleep uh, as, uh, as good as you could. If you've got uh, a toxic body, so there's toxins, a toxin load in your body, you're not going to sleep well. Um, many people don't sleep well because they dehydrated, <clears throat> so they've had too little water, and that uh, that leads to the fact that they don't they don't sleep well. Um, and then you know something that we need to be very very careful of is that we we don't have overstimulation shortly before bedtime. So don't don't look at a, a action movie a movie at that time before you want to go to bed. Um, that's not, you need, you need to tone down, you know, all that activity should tone down and uh, it, it sometimes takes to uh, half an hour for some people to, to really, you know, get to a point where they will fall asleep. And then another thing is raised carbon dioxide levels. That could also cause you to not sleep well. Um, obviously there's many other issues but that's the basic things that i've found over the years that would help people to um, uh, you know there's one or two supplements that i can advise if if uh, if that's needed but uh, normally normally you know looking at what is the problem here and sorting it it, it solves it here's another very important question <clears throat> and this is what can i do to treat eczema now, eczema or uh, dermatitis is normally caused by an allergic reaction, and there could be many different things that you could be allergic to. It could be contact with perfumes, um, things like cosmetics, rubber, uh, medicated creams, um, ointments, uh, they, you know, poison ivy. Um, some people are allergic to some metals and metal alloys like nickel and silver and gold and um, some types of food could actually cause an allergic reaction. I remember a few years back I gave public lectures like this and uh, a mother came very distraught to me with a little one um, and uh, I think he was about seven months old and his whole little body was covered with eczema, wet eczema from the top to the bottom. And this kid was just screaming all the time. And she said to me, listen, we've, we've taken all the ointments we got. We've put all of it on. We've done everything, but there's no relief, no relief. And I gave her the advice that I am giving you now. And within seven days, I left the town already. I, it was in the Eastern Cape in East London. I left and I got this message from her. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much because my kid is 100%. All the scales have fallen off, he is 100%. So this little one was just allergic to some of the things that they were using. So uh, 
it could actually be um, intensified by emotions, you know, like stress or fatigue, um, or deficiency of, um, you know, B-complex vitamins, that could cause it. Um, another important um, item is unsaturated uh, fatty acids. Um, if you are not getting enough of that, then, uh, then you could, uh, you know, tend to go into this direction. You know, it will start with some itching, and then, you know, if you rub the skin, you know, it will be sensitive. So, uh, adequate vitamin A is also then, uh, essential in the in the diet. Um, but uh, let me tell you the main culprits. Main culprits is cow's milk. Cow's milk. So, you know, this lady, I just told her, get your kid off cow's milk. She was not breastfeeding, so I said, get your kid off and get goat's milk or something else. Um, and yeah, this was part of the answer. Wheat gluten, wheat gluten, you know, that's the wheat protein. Um, because of the way that we produce these grains nowadays, um, that can cause some problems. And then, as I said, nickel is a, is a big one. We call it nickel rash. And um, yeah, then, you know, it could be other things, you know, like a ring, you know, the gold-plated things um, touching the skin. You know, I found many people struggling with, with that sort of thing. So one must just eliminate some of these things. Um, so for the start, for eczema, avoid all animal products, including dairy. They're full of hormones. They're full of uh, casein. Many people react to that. And so, um, especially when we're younger. And then a lot of relief can be found if one gives hot and cold treatment. So compresses. And just do this 10 to 15 minutes, hot, three minutes, cold, one minute, hot, cold. You'll do this two, three times a day. That will bring a lot of relief for, for this condition. So uh, I, hope, I hope that uh, this, uh, this helps a bit with this, um, be careful of bubble baths and stuff, especially for the, for the little ones. Uh, um, soaps, <laughs> soaps can, can really mess things up. Um, yeah, some, some kids, you know, they're allergic to eggs, uh, peanuts, um, wheat, fish, chicken, pork, many of them, uh, beef, yeah, so, yeah, but of this, 75% of the kids actually react to, to cow's milk. So, yeah, that's, uh, if you've got any other um, questions, you, you may uh, ask it to me. Here is my details on the screen at the moment. And um, I, would gladly, um, I would gladly answer them. They must just be with me tonight so that I can answer them tomorrow afternoon. All right, so uh, just a short uh, summary of the stress and depression recovery uh, presentation we had last night. We spoke about balance, so that's balance in life. We spoke about purposeful tasks. You know, I'm not gonna go into all the detail because of time. We go, you know, you have to structure and have regularity in that structure that you have. Um, healthy diet, very, very important. Avoid stimulants. Adequate rest, enough sleep, uh, daily exercise. We also look at uh, regular sun exposure and then productive hobbies. Um, you have to have something that would break your attention span. Um, and uh, yeah, then, you know, we need to change our perceptions, our expectations in life sometimes. You know, <laughs> that, that helps a lot. Uh, tasks into manageable parts. You know, don't let, you know, don't let the elephant stand there. You know, cut the elephant in little pieces <laughs> and uh, chew it, you know, one by one. Um, set reasonable, realistic goals for yourself. Don't set yourself high goals, you can't reach it and then you feel, um, you know, you've, you've failed. Avoid pres uh, procrastination where I just, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, set Boundaries. I mean, there's some times where I have to say to people, I cannot speak to you now. Um, I, you have to sit, otherwise you burn out. And then 
Avoid uh, compromising values and beliefs. If you've got certain values, certain beliefs, don't compromise on it because then you feel a failure. Don't, don't do that. Um, schedule me time. So you need to have time for yourself where you will do things that you enjoy. Um, and I'm not saying every day. I'm saying on your schedule, now and then, you'll have that. I have, uh, I have me time once a week for about three, four hours. Um, th that helps me a lot. In that time, I can concentrate and do something else. We need to forgive, and we need to be able to forgive ourselves. Major problem. And then we need to trust God that uh, He is in control and that He would help us. And then we need to have an attitude of gratitude. So I hope these 20 pointers to a recovery of stress and uh, depression would help you would help you a lot. There's some uh, responses I need to share with you. <clears throat> One is um, Pastor, that was a very wonderful presentation on Goodbye Stress. I really enjoyed, and I know now what I need to create the me time. I need to take care of myself as I take care of others. And this is really important. So it's not selfish. Um, but for you to be able to excel, you need that. Another one, amen and amen. Thank you for this encouragement. Another one, thank you, Pastor, for this information. I wish I had this, um, this some years back already. I lost uh, a loved one due to depression. We could have encouraged her in a different way than pushing for her to stay strong. So, you know, sometimes, and this is, this is something very valuable that she's picked up. Sometimes we say, you know, you must just be strong. You must just be strong. Pray more. But when you're depressed, you know, you cannot do those things. And that's the time that we, might, we need to rally around that person rather than just say, you know, you can do it. You can do it. You know, just look at God. He will help you. So um, I hope, I hope um, and I thank this person for this response because it really, you know, makes sense to me as well. I've learned so many things from my audiences over the many years, and I thank um, you for that as well. All right, so we're going to talk about goodbye uh, diabetes. I need to warn our audience, we might go a little bit over time. I'm not going to be able to finish at, at 7. I hope that I'm not going to be stoned because of that. Um, the reason is just that diabetes is such a major, major crisis, and it's a big subject, and it's a complicated thing. So I'm going to make it as simple as I can. But I normally would fit this in two or three sessions, and I'm now pressing it into one. So yeah, you know, this is, this is a very common um, newspaper headline, diabetes Bay's biggest killer. So you know, there was a time when HIV was the biggest killer, and there was a time where heart disease was the biggest killer. But uh, in certain areas in South Africa, the biggest killer is now diabetes. So we're going to talk about how to disarm diabetes to, tonight. And I want to tell you there's good news. There's good news about preventing and reversing diabetes. What I intend to do um, is tomorrow we're going to also have a longer session on cancer. And... Uh, I would later then spend some time and just give you some miracles of what God does uh, in, in, um, in healing people and certain conditions. So I'm going to just share that with you. And I'm really getting so excited about this because it is good news. You know, we mustn't just say, you know, I'm, I've got a death sentence because I'm a diabetic. We need to know that there's an explosion of new cases. Uh, in the past half century, uh, diabetes rates have soared to record heights. Um, it's doubled within the last 25 years. For many years, uh, there was no known cure for diabetes. But I want to tell you, it's, it's no more, it's not like that anymore. Today, many people are disarming diabetes by making healthful changes. People... I want you to know that when I have medication, that will cover the symptoms. It's not going to cure the problem. And so lifestyle needs to, to be, be put in. 
And I want you to listen well, because every time with every one of these topics, I'm saying the same thing, and you might get tired of this, but I'm saying, guys, until we do not that, do that, we will not have any progress. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is a disease that occurs when the body becomes unable to handle glucose. That's now the body's sugar, which builds up in dangerous levels in the bloodstream. So over time, these high blood sugar levels are extremely taxing on the body, uh, resulting in the dramatic increase in risk of death and even disability. Now, I want to, I want to tell you that there is two kinds of diabetes. Um, there's the type 2, that's the most common uh, the disease, type 2. And it's accounting for about 90% of diabetics. Um, then, this is normally all the people that get type 2 diabetes, although I've seen a big change in that in the last couple of years. Uh, there's an increase in children getting di uh, type 2 diabetes nowadays. And I want to tell you, type 2 diabetes is lifestyle related um, it means there's no insulin shortage with this disease so this type of diabetes is not so much a problem with a shortage of insulin in fact when diagnosed uh, most of these diabetics have plenty of insulin in their bodies but something blocks the insulin so that it cannot do its job properly and i'm going to with graphs show you what needs to happen there uh, in a very practical way. So the other disease is uh, type 1, and, um, and I want to tell you it's a totally, totally different type of disease. Um, it is insulin-dependent diabetes, and that affects about 5 to 10 percent of all diabetics. Um, so it means these individuals have lost the ability for them to make adequate amounts of insulin and they must now take insulin injections. And because of this, type 1 is known as insulin-dependent diabetes. So these diabetics, they typically develop a disease as children, young adults. They're usually thin. Um, and in today's talk, I'm just going to focus on type 2 diabetes. I'm not going to spend too much time. I just wanted you to have the, the background to this. So when we talk about diabetes in the world, uh, and this stat is not the newest, 382 million people, that's 2013. You can just understand that's nine years back. Um, 8.3% adults, now the reason why it's nine years back, <laughs> Um, they've not updated the stats on the platforms that I looked for it. Uh, 1.5 to 5 million deaths because of diabetes. Uh, that I've just determined is much higher. It's escalated much higher. Um, and it's increasing every, every day. In Africa, diabetes, 15 million diabetics. That's a lot of people. About 70% do not even know that they are diabetics. They don't know it. So if you would go into the rural areas here, you would find people would have diabetes, raised sugar levels. They don't even know it. They've got no idea. Um, also increasing every day. More and more people every day. 3.5 million people um, in South Africa alone. That's 6% of the population. And this is old stats. I think it's, it's much higher at this point. 12% in the Indian uh, population, 9% in the colored community, 6% amongst our black people, and then about 4% with our, our white people. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the statistics I need to share with you, the largest analysis of health trends around uh, in 188 countries from 1990 to 2013 revealed a striking rise in diabetes of 45% in America in the same period, it was 71%. So it's skyrocketing there. So how does diabetes work? I just want to tell you, this is another pandemic. 
Um, and that's the reason why I gave you all the stats. So how does it work? How does this disease work? Well, glucose is like the fuel is for a car. Glucose is that for you, your body. That's what gives you the energy. The main fuel for your body is simple sugar called glucose. What gasoline is to your car, petrol, diesel, glucose is to your body. However, glucose can only be converted to usable energy in the presence of insulin. So you need insulin to make this glucose work on cell level. So when we look at uh, a cell, I want to say it's like a door, and the door's got a lock, and the, the lock has got a key. So insulin is that hormone needed to convert that sugar and that starches and other foods into energy. And it works like this, the, the, the insulin is that key, it will unlock the door and then the door will open and the glucose will go into the cell. We don't want the glucose to be in the arteries, it, we want it to be in the cells. So what many times happen is um, in type 1 diabetes, we don't have enough insulin, so the key is not there to open the door. But when we look at, or, or, or it could even be gummed up, so something has blocked that keyhole so it can't get in there. And uh, that's what most of the time happened with type 2 diabetes. So there's enough insulin, the key's there, but you know, the hole is blocked up, it's gummed up. And then this blood sugar raises in the arteries. It must be in the cell, but it can't get in because insulin can't open. So what is the warning signs that uh, you are di that you can tend to, to being a diabetic? Well, one of the first things is that you've got excessive thirst. You know, you're thirsty all the time and you drink, but you <laughs> it doesn't quench your thirst. Another one is that you urinate, you know, much more than, than you should. And obviously, if you drink more and more and more, you would have to urinate more and more. And then you would have an excessive appetite. So you would just have a, you know, more appetite and you can just imagine what happens. You know, this is a domino effect. So type two diabetics, you know, they would have raised body mass index. So there would be weight challenges. Um, so yeah, this is the classic symptoms. Um, but I want to tell you, these warning signs are sometimes very subtle. Half of the people don't know that they, that they actually um, have this illness. Many become aware of this only when they begin to experience potentially irreversible problems. Um, you, know, they, they, you know, they've got eyesight problem. And, you know, they go to the... Um, to the eye doctors and they find out, no, there's a, there's a, there's a problem here. And that's when we find out, okay, there's, there's, there's bigger challenges. I wanna tell you this uh, disease, diabetes, as it progresses, it affects are devastating to most of the organs in our body. So um, it's gradually destroying organs in your body. So there's a lot of complications like eye problems, so my, um, my uh, biggest best friend is an is a eye surgeon, and most of the people that he sees is people that are diabetic. Um, kidney damage, uh, heart disease, there's 18 more times likelihood of kidney damage to those that are diabetic. Um, many eventually experience kidney failure, and then heart disease. Um, it's, uh, it's promoting atherosclerosis. That's the plugging of the arteries, so the blood can't go through, and then, you know, we, we find that we have a stroke or we had a heart attack. We've got two to four times more likelihood to suffer from a heart attack and a stroke if I'm a diabetic, and it normally ends up fatal. I mean, normally it's the end. There's another complication, it's like wounds do not heal. So if, they, if you bump yourself and there's an open wound, it just doesn't heal. Um, and um, yeah, people that have uh, diabetes, they live eight to 10 years shorter than others. 
I, I hope this really helps us to understand, guys, why it's so important to prevent rather than now try to cure it when, we've got, when we get there. Um, in addition to this, uh, diabetes increases your chances of sexual impotency, um, ulcerated sores, infections, amputations, breast and uterine cancers, um, yeah, keeping your blood sugar levels, people, uh, near, near as normal to the normal range uh, is, your, is, is the best thing that you could ever do. Um, you should keep it not below three, not higher than six, and I'm going to show you graphs how to get there. So what causes non-insulin dependent diabetes? What causes this? I think this is what we need to know. Um, is it a matter of genetics? Question, is it a matter of genetics? You know, my, my father had it, and his mother had it, so now I'm going to have it. Um, let me give you an example. The Prima Indians, the Prima Indians, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a population group especially prone for diabetes. Uh, among the Pima Indians of the southwestern United States, half of the adults suffer from type 2 diabetes. Half of it, 50%. But I want to tell you that genes are not the primary culprit. And uh, it took the Western diet and lifestyle to turn their genetics to, uh, to become an epidemic with diabetes. I want to tell you that more and more researchers are concluding that uh, heredity is not the destiny, especially if you eat well and you exercise. Now, one of the examples is there's a, 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 um, a tribe that's very closely related to the Pima Indians living in Mexico, but they've got an active farming lifestyle. They eat traditional food. They experience far less, so the genetics is the same, but they experience far less um, diabetes in, in that, uh, in that uh, people group. Now, what is the problem? What is the problem? What is the problem with type 2 diabetes? Now, if you look in the graph here, you'll see that uh, that blue balls represents the glucose. And you'll see that rough edge there, that's the, um, the cell wall, and you'll see the entry points for that glucose. So in most cases, the problem lacks, uh, is a lack of sensitivity to, to insulin that would open those little doors rather than a shortage of diabetes. And uh, the, the cells simply fail to respond to insulin. So insulin be there, and as I said, you know, the keyhole is locked, so it doesn't open it. And so what happens is there's a build-up of, uh, of this uh, glucose in the arteries. And by the way, that over a period of time causes a lot of damage, as we said. So uh, it, will, it, will, uh, it will damage really every organ at the end of the day. So the resistance to insulin appears to be directly related to certain lifestyle factors. Now, if I give this in another graph, you'll see that my pancreas is now producing this insulin. There's a little doors, and there's a little key insulin that opens the doors. Insulin is manufactured by that special, special uh, uh, organ, the pancreas. Um, but that receptor where that insulin needs to plug in, like a key in a hole, it can't go in. It cannot open the door, and we call it insulin resistance. So there's, there is the insulin there, but it's, it cannot open the door. So when insulin attacks the receptor, um, or attaches, uh, sorry, not attacks, attaches to that uh, the receptor, it activates the enzyme. And then that enzyme activates another two enzymes, which uh, activates another enzyme. And so at the end of the day, there's four enzymes that uh, would allow the glucose to enter into the cell. And you can see those enzymes are not there. 
then that action would not happen. And people, the big reason for this is enzymes come from the food we eat. Enzymes is not manufactured by just the body. Our body cannot manufacture it without certain food stuff. And this is one of our main problems. So the more we get more westernized and we eat all these refined and, uh, and, and processed foods, those enzymes are lacking. And this causes insulin resistance at the end of the day. So um, let me give you another graph. There's now, there's now a cell there. You'll see there's an opening, a door opening, and there's the insulin receptor. So remember just now I used a key as an example. I'm just changing a little bit. I'm saying, guys, same story. The door is there, but now we are living in a new age where, you know, when I want to go into my hotel room, I just use a card and I press it there. That's now what I'm saying to you. So there's, a, there's an insulin receptor. And that insulin would go and sit on that receptor. It fits onto that receptor. And then you'll see that that glucose that's now in the blood, it wants to go into the cell, but that receptor must fit on there. And so what happens is if it fits in there, the glucose then goes into the cell and that's where we need the glucose. That gives me the energy. That helps me to think clearly. That helps my, my body to work properly. Now, the body's alarm goes off when the following things would happen. It's a siren that goes off. If I've got tummy fat, I want to tell you it never lies. So people would say to me, no, no, no. Uh, as a counselor, you know, I counsel with people. They would say, no, no, I've got no sugar problems. I said, we can test it. But just looking at you, I suspect it might be a problem. How can you see that? Well, I can see there's a little hole there that should not be there. Are you with me? So a healthy pancreas, uh, beta cells, they spurt out these little insulin. Every 14 minutes, they spurt out insulin. And then this tired pancreas cells has irregular insulin beta cells, spasms. And uh, what happens is, and what should happen is we should have a slow release energy level with those sugar levels not going higher than six and not going lower than three. But what happens is if I don't have a good meal, I'm eating at irregular times, insulin is pumped out. Uh, well, insulin is not pumped out. <laughs> my sugar levels in my body just goes soaring up and it comes crashing down soaring up crashing down soaring up many times i don't have breakfast i run for work by 10 o'clock i'm feeling very tired and i go to because i'm far from home now i go to just the shop around the corner and i buy uh, fast food or i just have a snack or i just have a cup of coffee and what happens is it shoots the sugar up higher than it should over the six but there's no fiber to keep it there. It comes just crashing down, brrr, and it crashes down at the bottom. So tummy fat tells no lies. It tells me that the blood sugar curve is abnormal. It's not slow release. It's there. That's what a tummy flap tells me. <laughs> Overstimulated pancreas then produces too much insulin because the sugar is up there, so it pumps in insulin to help to rectify this and um, yeah it happens very rapidly and then the brain registers every sudden rise of this insulin and it programs the cells in order to stop too much insulin from getting into the cells and its goal is to stop the insulin from damaging the cells because too much insulin damages the cells as well and so this changes the excess glucose changes it into fat. And this is why I'm now gaining that fat, especially around this area. Very interesting that we are finding now in our research. So triglycerides, they rise. That's now the form in which fats are stored in our body. And the risk factor for heart disease just goes up. You can just understand what happens. And my HDL, that's now the cholesterol clearing cholesterol, <laughs> that is lowered 
So HDL is my good cholesterol. Let's lower it. My, uh, my problem is now that that increases my risk for heart disease, for cancer. And there's a few other things as well. And that causes my sodium balance to go out. That means my blood pressure goes up. And it's interesting. So we feeling we don't feel good. We go to the doctor. We get some pills for the high blood pressure, because we, and then we get pills for the sugar. And the problem is these pills is not really rectifying the problem. It's lifestyle. Unfortunately, our doctors don't have the time to teach you from A to Z to go through the lifestyle thing. And that causes kidney damage and damaged blood vessels leading to the heart disease. And it, it damages the nerves to the eyes. And so a lot of complications. Um, yeah, so raised blood insulin levels is shown to be a start for nearly every, listen well, every chronic disease known to man. If your insulin levels is up or down, it means you've got a risk for cancer, you've got a, uh, you've got a risk for, for uh, heart disease, diabetes, aging, arthritis, osteoporosis, the things we spoke about this whole week. There's the answer. There's the answer. Now, there's something else that I need to just share with you, um, and this is newest research. Uh, glycation and raised blood sugar levels. So when your blood sugar gets too high, you saw that graph, that blue line, it goes up there. Your organs are toast, literally, because of that high, of that high sugar levels there. And the process by which this happens is called glycation. Now, I don't want you to remember all these big words, but I want you to get the concept. Glycation is a process where the sugar chemically combines with protein or fat. And you've seen glycation in your own kitchen. I'm sure. You've toasted bread and left it in the toaster too long, and what happens to the bread? It burns. That black there, that's the bread that toasted. It's the sugar in that bread and the proteins that combine, and it causes the bread to go brown. That's glycation. <laughs> so when you caramelize onions with sugar on the stove plate, hot, I mean, that's what happens. And this is what happens in your cells now. So, um, yeah, it becomes, as I said, toast. So in your body, when you have too much sugar, the body can't use the fats enough, uh, fast enough, the excess sugar reacts with the proteins in your cells, and it becomes toasted. It becomes toasted. So this creates nasty substances called advanced glycation in products. We call it AGEs, AGEs for short. So it is AGEs that cause your nerves to be tingling or numb or painful. So diabetics would know what I'm talking about. You know, where there's this tingling in the, in the legs or in the, in the hands. Um, that is the reason why this is, why this is happening. There's another thing that I need to share with you, and I don't want to go too technical, get too technical, but you need to know the concept, and that is sorbitol and diabetes. So there's indications that uh, when blood sugar is uncontrolled, and many diabetics are there, that the sugar gets converted into sorbitol, which is an, uh, it's, a, it's an oxidant. So it makes, it's, it's, it's bad for us, it's bad for us, I can't say it any other way. Um, it is said that sorbitol is uh, responsible for most of the de degenerative associations with, with diabetes. So it's an oxidant. It causes inflammation in the body. And we spoke about inflammation many times. We said, guys, one of the key factors to hypertension is inflammation. We said one of the key factors to arthritis is what? Inflammation. We said to you that uh, uh, for diabetes, inflammation is a big problem. I'm going to tell you tomorrow that with cancer, inflammation is the problem. So sorbitol found in the, is found in products such as chewing gum, sweets, ice cream, um, cough syrups, um, and yeah, it's broken down very slowly by your body 
and can cause blouting from gas producing bacteria in your intestines and so on. Let me talk to you about sugar and your white blood cells. This is very important to know. So we've got little white blood cells. We've got different, and we, in this week, we have shared with you the different ones. I'm gonna focus here on the, the, the little ones, uh, the, the little uh, lymphocytes, the little phagocytes, the little foot shoulders. And what's interesting is, if you have no sugar in your diet, your little phagocytes, it's like little Pac-Man. You know what Pac-Man, you know that game, computer game, Pac-Man? Some, my generation would probably know about it. <laughs> They've got new things nowadays. So Pac-Man goes and it wop, 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 and it goes and gobble up all the things. Now in this case, the phyto, uh, these, these uh, phagocytes, they go and gobble up bacteria, for instance. And so they go around and 14 times they will gobble up something and then they die. If I have six teaspoons of sugar in my diet, it will only gobble up 10 times and then it will die. If I have 12 teaspoons of sugar in my 24 hour cycle day, it will only gobble up five and a half times, then it will die. If I have 18 teaspoons of sugar in a day, it will gobble up, whoop, whoop, dead. If I have 24 teaspoons of sugar in a day, it will gobble up one time and it will die. 92% less productivity. Now you might say to me, Ooh, Pastor, how do you get 24 teaspoons of sugar? I'll tell you what, it's very easy. <laughs> I don't have the time to tell you this in detail, but one tin of Coke has got 10 teaspoons of sugar. So if you've got two of them, you've already got 20. And some people, that's what they drink. I mean, we're not talking about the sugar that you put in your coffee or your or your beverages that you drink. We're not talking about the jam that you put on your bread. We're not talking about all the sugar that's put into the food. All of that adds up. Most people are more than 30 teaspoons of sugar a day in the Western society. Now, let, let me show you what happens. Here is a, um, a microscope video of, uh, of a, it's a blood analysis. So you'll see there that big little thing there in the middle, that is now a little phagocyte. And it is now going to find that, you see that little black spot there, that's now a germ that it's gonna go for. And so there you, oh, let me go back, let me go back, let me start it there, there you can see, it runs after it, it runs after it. That's what happens in your blood all the time. And it's, that, can, that thing can make you very sick. It can kill you at the end of the day. So your phagocyte goes and it goes and it, it pursues it. It will just, and there, whop. I've only had 24 teaspoons of sugar. It only did that once and it will die. If I've got no sugar, it will go 14 of those germs it will go and kill and then it will die. Every time there's a sudden drop in the blood, sugar, our brain computer registers the fact and thinks that famine is occurring. So the most efficient way to save fuel is to change the sugar in the fat and pack it around the tummy. This is why I've learned if there's tummy, if there's a little troopy there, it means the sugar levels aren't stable. So the brain receives almost 25% of the oxygen and the glucose from the blood. I want you to know that. And it has to have a constant supply of both um, the oxygen and the sugar. You know, you can't be in the water, under the water, for longer than how many minutes? Doctor, how many minutes? Then you'll drown? Yeah? five minutes at max four minutes we need oxygen all the time you cannot i mean you hold your breath see if you can hold it for three and a half minutes four minutes it's hard you cannot do that so we need it all the time and 25 percent of the oxygen that you breathe in needs to go to your brain so it has to have constant supply of oxygen and of of uh, of uh, glucose so if i've got a swinging blood sugar level it means I'm gonna have poor brain function. 
This is one of the things what I found after my cancer uh, experience where I changed my lifestyle and I started with postgraduate studies and it was just like so much easier. I mean, I did so much better than when I was younger. So this, this means that every time that your sugar level goes out of the six or lower than the three, when it comes back into the norm between six and three, you'll, you can look at that graph, it means it takes 45 to 75 minutes after that blood there returns there for your brain to work optimally again. So that means the swing up and down, as this graph would show, <laughs> you're never going to have a brain that's going to work optimally. So that's going to leave you feeling sluggish after eating. You feel you need a nap. Food cravings. Even after eating, you crave something. And some people call it a sweet tooth. Especially something fatty, or something sweet. Refined starch foods. Soft things. I don't want to chew on it, I must just swallow. <laughs> and it will generally make you feel bloated, tired, fatigued during the day. It would lead to constipation, it leads to headaches, You'll feel anxious, impatient, irritable, or feel jittery, shaky, even lightheaded, crave snacks between meals, you know, that feeling of, I need to eat now, I can't wait until, you know, meal time. And you could even have cold sweats, ringing the ears. Now let me just share with you the, 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 the psychology of this diabetic, uh, to, uh, diabetic condition of type 2 diabetes. Conventional medicine most commonly calls it uh, a, a dysregulation of blood sugar control. The normal treatment is pills and or insulin. Now some say that the real problem is improper insulin and leptin signaling. That's the problem. Now, these two decide how much food you eat as well as your body weight. It is said to be primarily caused by a diet that is too high in sugars, refined carbohydrates. It is said to be, um, uh, to put as simple as we can, you know, that glucose gates in the cell walls can't open, so the sugar builds up in the bloodstream. And uh, I want to tell you, studies dating back nearly a century back, noted a striking finding. If you take a young, healthy person and split them in two groups, half of them you put on a fat-rich diet and half of them you put on a carb-rich diet. Within two days, glucose intolerance skyrockets in the fat group. That's, that's reality. So the same was done uh, with the sugar challenge. And those who had been shoveling fat ended up with twice the blood sugar. As fat goes up, blood goes, the blood sugar spikes. It would take scientists nearly 70 years to unravel this mystery with a special BMI uh, test. It is now known that fat can also cause insulin resistance. This is why I am pleading with you, and I've said it all the time, guys, go off animal products because that's where the fat problem lies. You're not going to have the risk of these problems if you would do that. So it is, um, this mechanism wasn't known until fancy MRI techniques were developed to see what was happening inside of people's muscles and their cells uh, as the fat was infused into the bloodstream. They saw what was happening. And that's how they found that raised fat levels could also cause insulin resistance. And this is why the dietitian would say to you, you must go on a low-fat diet when you, are, um, when you are a diabetic. It's not just about sugar. It is that as well. So, yeah. It stopped glucose from going into the muscle cells. That's part of what the, 
what uh, the Fed does. And the resistance can happen in 160 minutes from just one heat of fat. So if I would have a fast food burger with chips, it's high fat, within 160 minutes, that resistance to your insulin levels would occur. That's it. And yeah, they found the same effect with healthy teenagers. So it's not like, you know, there's something wrong with you because you're older. No. So um, they did the opposite experiment when they, they cleared the fat out of the diet, out of the experiment, and when they cleared the fat out of the diet, insulin resistance dropped proportionate to the amount of fat in the diet. So insulin resistance, gone. Now, if this science says that, if we would change our diet and we would take that fat out of our diet, then the insulin would come back to normal. Isn't it so? Absolutely. That's what logic says. So the hypothesis is, if fat gums up that insulin uh, receptors, and it happens very quickly, we know that excess sugar gets converted into fat and stored around the tummy, then it's possible that the gumming up of these receptors from glucose, that's all carbohydrates, it is not actually from the glucose, but it's from the fat that has been created from the glucose. That's why we said this part is really the answer for me to say there is a problem with the sugar. I don't even have to do a sugar test. So obesity and excess fat. Many studies have demonstrated a strong relationship between fat and diabetes. Both fat in the diet and fat on the body. The more fat there is in the diet, the more difficult it is for insulin to get glucose into the cells. Then you're going to have a raised blood sugar level. We don't want that. Diabetes people is rare in world areas where fat intake is low and obesity is uncommon in those areas. So we have to take cognizance of this. Another problem is inactivity. You know, in the past, even, even in my years, 40 years back, when, when TVs just started, and uh, yeah, maybe it started earlier than that, but that's when we got a TV. <laughs> I mean, we had to walk to the TV and we had to adjust it there. What do we do today? We sit in our chair and we just take the remote and we, we flip channels and we make it louder and we make it soft and whatever. We don't even get up to do that. I mean, we don't walk. We, we drive with a car or we take public transport. We don't walk. I mean, in the past, people would have walked wherever they want to get. So um, our sedentary lifestyle is one of the primary contributors to obesity and insulin resistance. We need to keep that in mind. Too many calories um, and too little exercise. So we eat a lot of calories, but we don't do, you know, we don't have output to that. Um, and um, that's, that's a key risk factor for, for type 2 diabetes. So any way to reverse diabetes? That's a question I get all the time. Is there any way to reverse it? Well, let me tell you, nearly 100% of the time it's caused by lifestyle, and thus it will be reversed by lifestyle. I've seen... So many cases of serious, serious <laughs> diabetes, where people are insulin reversed by lifestyle. So, yeah, please, just after this one, don't ask me, Pastor, what is the remedies for diabetes? You're going to get me discouraged if you ask me that. Because I've told you guys over and over, guys, it's not just a pill that I swallow. It is a change of my, how I live that's going to make the difference. There's no other way. Pills and insulin offer symptomatic treatment, but do not address the core issues. I want you to know that. So how do we disarm diabetes? Let me give it to you. I need to eat a low-fat diet. I'm a, I need to lower the amounts of oil in the diet. It plays a crucial role in, in preventing uh, and reversal of type 2 diabetes. When you have less fat, then the sensitivity of my insulin is gradually restored. 
I've seen this happen. It's not like I'm wondering about it. You need to eat more fresh fruits and veggies. Something in our Western diet that we don't do anymore. The best way is to find a plant-based diet in your lifestyle and exclude animal products. I, I, I mean even your milk, even your cheese, even your eggs, because that is going to cause part of the problem. All right? Eat a high-fiber diet. So I need to make choices. Am I going to eat the brown bread that I have to chew, or am I going to eat a white bread that I just swallow and it's gone? I mean, that's the choice. So we need to eat more natural, fiber-rich food, and uh, our blood sugar levels will be nice and stable. The moment I have carbohydrates with fiber in it, it will give me that slow release energy level. It's not going to spike. It won't. It will never. It cannot spike. So we need to eat these, these unrefined foods high in fiber. It includes whole grains, cereals, breads, cooked beans, peas, fruits, vegetables, high in fiber. That's what we need to eat in our diet. Then we need to get regular exercise. And we've said many times, guys, just 30 minutes of walk in a day, that will do such a big difference. You see, through regular exercise, the need for insulin injections can often be reduced very, very quickly. And I'll give you examples as I end this session. Regular physical activity enables the sugar to enter the body cells even without insulin. I need to achieve a healthy weight. It's vital that we do this. It will disarm diabetes if I start working at that. Remember, we talk about that, that little uh, choopy that we have. This is a worldwide pandemic. This is why we spend one night just on obesity. So health experts warn us that obesity is rising and uh, we can make a difference with that. We need to have a permanent lifestyle. People, I said it last night, I said it the previous night, don't go on some other diet. It does not work. The best approach is achieving and maintaining a healthy weight is not to diet, but permanently change the way that you live. Change the way you live. Don't go and start a diet. Have a low-fat, plant-based diet. Eating most of your calories at breakfast. And then lunch. That would be an excellent choice. Couple that with daily activity, exercise, and you're going to have lasting success. It's not just going to be for a month or two and then you gain back what you've lost. No. Let's talk about a breakfast. People, you've heard me many times talk about breakfast. And as you can see, with diabetes, it is largely preventable. The good news is that those who have already had this disease, they can control it and many times even reverse it without drugs by following a healthy lifestyle. I'm not sucking this with my thumb. I've seen many people go through this process. So the most important facet is to make a breakfast the largest meal of your day. And many of us don't do that. We come and have our large meal at home this afternoon. And then from there we go to bed. If you want to reverse diabetes, that's the one thing you won't do. You will not eat in the evening or you'll eat very, very little, like just one fruit. You will eat your biggest meal at breakfast. It's the meal that will include fruits. And knowing the principles, making a good breakfast is essential for long-term success. So uh, I've sent you on the group, I've sent you how to make a hot box breakfast. I've sent you, I've sent you the recipes to do it. So try and eat at the same time every day. If preparation, we should take no more than 10 minutes tonight to have a good breakfast tomorrow morning. And that, I send you that recipe to see what, it, uh, what it's about. And uh, for those that's online, that's not on this specific group, that's why we said register, because then I could send those documents to you. So we can show you how to make this 
good breakfast that would take you 10 minutes tonight and you have this good breakfast tomorrow. Eat enough so that you will not be hungry before lunchtime. Your next meal, you're not going to be hungry there. Um, and this is the essence of blood control, sugar control. We shouldn't have this and this. Hungry, yeah, when it shoots down here. It crashes down here. You know, cook in bulk. Freeze it. And then you just unfreeze it when you want it. Another one is, important thing is our essential fatty acids. Remember the omega-3, 6, and 9s? I did send you that recipe, or didn't I? Maybe I did not. Um, I might not have. I, I will just make sure that I did send you this recipe. I think I did. This is very, very important. So include more omegas in your food, uh, in, your, in your diet. Reduce the amount of omega-6s in your diet because that is inflammatory causing. And remember, the connection is there between diabetes and inflammation. Cancer and inflammation. Arthritis and inflammation. Probably your easiest way is to include four tablespoons of linseed a day on your breakfast. So I have, I've got a, a porridge breakfast normally every morning and I would have at least three tablespoons of ground up linseed, uh, sesame, sunflower, and pumpkin seed on there. And I tell you what, it makes a big difference. I can give you so many testimonies of this, of people's lives that have changed. There's some routine matters I need to share with you. Chew your food well, it's important. So this food that you just bite and swallow, like white bread, it's not good for you. You need to chew it because that's when it mixes with the enzymes. That's when all that enzymes four phases is, is needed. That's where we get it from. People have a variety of different food over a period of time. Don't just have oats. I asked one person, what do you eat for breakfast? Oats. Okay, and, and one day. The next day, what do you eat? Oats. And, uh, okay, the third day, what are you eating? Oats. Okay, okay. Day five, what do you eat? Hey, man, oats. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't, you must eat different things, different grains. I gave you a whole array of different grains. I'm sure it will be available in Zambia. I'm sure about it. And I want to tell you, in South Africa, there's 42 different grains. All we know is millies and rice and wheat. That's all we know. But there's 42. There's, well, there's now 39 others that we, in South Africa, I, I think there might even more be more in Zambia because yeah, your climate is good yeah, man. Um, you can choose whether you want to two or three meals a day. I say two meals a day is better than, than the three. I've been on it for 25 years, no problems. Stable weight, energy levels high, no problems. People, the rule is that when you go to bed, your tummy must be empty. Don't eat a meal and then go to bed. If you want to, you, if you want to suffer with diabetes sometime, you, that's what you do. That's what you need to do. Eat enough at a meal so that you do not feel eating in between meals. So you know, we need not to snack in between meals. People leave party food for party time. We don't have parties every day. I'm not saying you may not have party food once in a while. I'm not saying it. I'm not a fanatic. I want to tell you, our problem is we eat party food every day of the week. That's our problem. So when we have a plate, I'm just giving you a sample here you'll see that there's uh, a division major, there's quite a bit of, of vegetables on this plate and fresh things. That's where the enzymes are in. And then you'll see the big base there of uh, carbohydrates, that's in the form of whole, uh, whole grain um, rice and some beans. I love beans. Bean stew and, oh, that's good. So one will have to have that, you know, that, um, that division on your, on your plate. Now, I need, to, I need to ask a question. Does science show what I just said tonight? Does science show that? Well, there's a study, a Taiwanese study. It compared vegetarians and non-vegetarians um, 
there was Buddhist monks in this uh, in the study as well, and uh, they found that those that were on a plant-based diet were more protected against diabetes. They did not get diabetes as the others. They had less glucose intolerance. There was an Indian study, and it's a big study, 156,000 adults in this study, and they put them on a lacto-ovo and semi-vegetarian diets. So lacto-ovo, lacto is milk, and milk and eggs is lacto-ovo, and others on the semi-vegetarian diet. And they found that there was much lower risk in diabetes. Adventists in North America, vegetarian diets protect against diabetes. Now you'll see that small print there on my screen, that is where I get the research from. I'm not thumb sucking this, this is, this is good news people, <laughs> this is reality, the science proves this. So over 50% of type 2 diabetes can be reversed. And I've seen many of them being reversed. So this is why I can title this session, Goodbye Diabetes. And you might be one of those that God can help. How does this happen? I want to say to you, don't stop your medication. That's the one thing I need to say to you. People get in trouble. They come to our lifestyle centers, they leave all the medication at home, and because I'm going to the lifestyle center, no, we all say, bring it with. You're not just going to stop medication. You need to tell your doctor about that. <laughs> you cannot just stop the medication. You've been on it for a long time. But you need to start this process now. That's what you need to do. So I want to give you just, maybe I shouldn't even do this. In cases, you know, that percentage of lifestyle has been involved 100%, but it just, just doesn't do the 100% for us to reverse it 100%. We have found a remedy that really helps amazingly. And that is one thing, cinnamon mimics insulin's method of blood sugar control. Uh, so methyl, hydroxy, uh, chalcone, polymer, it is the key ingredient that carries out this little task. And cinnamon has Unfortunately, a little irritating oil in it that needs to be gotten rid of before we can actually use this as a remedy. So uh, what we do is we will, we will buy a box of cinnamon. So that's not the bottle of powder, hey. This is now the sticks, the cinnamon sticks. We'll buy a, a, a box of sticks and we will, we will put it in a pot. We will, we'll get a pot and we put a liter of water in there We'll put the one box of cinnamon sticks in there and we'll boil it for 15 minutes. And then we will allow it to stand to get cold again. And then we will pour this liquid into a measuring jug in order to reconstitute one liter because one liter has gotten less because of the boiling. And then we will strain this liquid through a thin cloth and that irritating oil would stay behind on the cloth. And that liquid you will use, so you will top it up to one liter again with water, and you will use one tot glass. You know what's a tot glass? Are you all with me? Not a glass, a tot glass. You know a communion glass? Something like that. <laughs> All right, a one tot glass. You will, you will have that um, three times a day. All right, so this is really going to help the insulin. So somebody that's not with a lifestyle getting it, that's what we'll do. We also put the person on chromium. Um, and you'll take one tablet a day till you have used one container. But that's something that we can help you. Another one that helps a lot is brewer's yeast or torilla yeast. And... Um, yeah, that is, that is something that would help you to, to get that glucose levels nice and stable. People, can diabetes be prevented? I want to say to you, yes, in 80% of the cases. 80% of the cases. My question to you is, what do you want in life? 
What do you want in life? I'm sure you want health. Is there somebody that wants to put a hand? Who wants health? Okay, I see a few hands. Not everybody wants health. Okay. Okay. Who wants joy in their lives? Absolutely. I see a lot of hands go up. And hope? Who wants hope? I mean, we live in a hopeless world. Yeah. Who wants family? Yeah, we want family. Guys, it's not too late to have those things. Because you see, when I've got the condition like diabetes, I don't have these things as I should have. And I want to tell you what I said to you before. It is not too late. It's not too late. Now, I want to give you one example. By the way, don't look at that 100% diabetes recovery um, in the sense that I say it's 100%. I just told you it's 80%. But this man, this man, Hendrik Besaid note, had 100% diabetes recovery. In his case, he was on 95 units of insulin per day in a 24-hour cycle. And this man, besides having that insulin, his blood sugar levels were still 18, 10, 20, all over the place. I remember the day when he came to see me. He, he saw my program on television on brain power. And he phoned me and he said to me, listen, um, I want to just tell you that I have, I've started applying some of those principles and it really works. And I said, praise God for that. I did a prayer with him. And a few days later, he phoned me, and I remember, I was in the Eastern Cape, I was far from, you know, good signal and all that, and he was trying to talk to me, and I said, man, I can't really talk to you now, but, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll talk later. And he called me again, and he called me again. And the one day, I, I said, Hendrik, where do you stay? I would like us to meet. And he said to me, he stays in the Strand. Now, I, at that point, I stayed in Somerset West. That's 10 minutes' drive from each other. I said, man, you must come and see me at my office. He came to me. I tell you, when he came to my office, when he walked into my office, it became dark, and then it became light again. What do I mean by that? He's such a big man. He takes all the air out of that door. It's like a door, you know? Big man. He's, he's, I, I took his, I took his, uh, while my assistant took his um, blood pressure, it was uh, 240 over 140. 40, something like that. I mean, I whispered to the secretary, I said, get an ambulance. Don't want this guy to die. Me. He heard me when saying that. And he said, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. I, uh, this is one of my good days. He's on a lot of medication for, for blood pressure. He's on insulin. People, I want to tell you, in one month's time, in one month's time, there was a serious change where he phoned me one day and he said, listen, you're going to make me die. I said, what do you mean I'm going to make you die? He says, my blood sugar, now you can understand, a guy that never had a blood sugar level that, you know, would go below, you know, it will always be, you know, six, seven, eight, it would never go lower. Now it's all of a sudden it's three. He's getting anxious. He says, I'm going to go in a coma. You, you, it's going to be your fault. And I said, Hendrik, I told you, just find your doctor. Let him adjust your medication. I can't find him. And it's going to be your fault. And so I asked our doctor that helps us with P3. free I asked him, I said, Doc, I don't want to give the number to this patient, but can I, can I ask you to phone him? Will you do that? Oh, can I give? He says, no, I'll phone him. And he phoned him and he, he helped him. A few days later, he phoned again. I didn't, I didn't get the number of your doctor. He phoned me and, and now I'm in trouble. Like I said, what about your doctor? No, I can't find him. I said, okay, here's the doctor's number. I gave him the doctor. Doctor helped him. People within six months, insulin gone. No insulin. No insulin. For the first time in his last, he was 22 years already boarded. He couldn't work because of his condition. For the first time, his sugar levels were stable. What was the main thing? I sat with him. This picture that, that you see on the screen here was taken in a, at an audience of 3,500. This was recorded and was broadcasted. 
And he stands here with his hand because I said to him, you know, at that point he lost like 60 kgs, no diets. He just followed the principles that I told him in the hour's consultation. That's it. And yeah, no one then he phoned me and said, how must I do this? And he was standing with his, with his pants like this because I said, bring your old pants with so people can see how big you were. And so when he, he left his, he, he let go, his pants dropped. Everybody's eyes went big. He had underpants underneath. And I want to tell you, this is my God, the healer God, that gave us this information to help people to, to change. At this point, this guy was bored. He didn't have a work. Today, you know what happened? In the meantime, I mean, he's not a young person. In the meantime, he went to study. He finished his BTH degree. He's a pastor today. This is just a few years back. I think it was 20, 2012, 2013, around there. So I tell you what, God is such a great God. Why do we have to experience, I'm asking you, why do we have to experience loss of quality of life even lose our limbs because we, before we are prepared to make simple changes in our lifestyle. I don't understand that. Why would people have to have their leg cut off because of diabetes before they make a change? Why cannot we make some changes? There's a verse in the Bible in Proverbs 27 verse 12 that says, a prudent person foresees the danger ahead and takes precaution. The simpleton, he goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. <laughs> I don't want to be a simpleton. I want to be a prudent person. You've got the choice. You want to see the danger coming. I don't want to get cancer again. That's why I'm living a, a controlled, disciplined life every day by God's grace. I'm just trying every day to live a controlled, disciplined life. Because I have been there. I don't want to go there again. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading that the Holy Spirit would talk to you and help you to make those changes. That we would go and help others so that they would not suffer. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity we had tonight to talk about this very important subject. It's a very complicated one, Lord, but thank you for all the principles that you've taught us. And as we now go and apply this, as we go and help others to apply it, may we see the miracles in people's hearts and lives as you touch them with your healing power. I thank you for each one that's been in this audience tonight. I pray for those that are watching online and that this message will go out, that there is an answer, there is good news. May we take it, Lord, and make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a very informative uh, presentation. I hope that we have learned something that was uh, going to help us make changes in our lives. For indeed, why should we be simpletons who walk into, who see danger and walk into it? We pray that God will give us wisdom to make the choices and decisions that take us away from uh, suffering consequences of uh, bad uh, diets. We thank uh, Pastor Arnold for his uh, presentation, and we continue to pray that God will minister to us through his uh, spirit. We will have another session tomorrow where Pastor will talk about uh, saying goodbye to cancer. For today, 
I pray that each of us will travel home safely and that we'll be able to come back uh, to worship tomorrow in the morning. Our services start in the morning. And we invite those of you that are watching online to join us in our normal worship services in the, uh, at 8 o'clock. And also at uh, 2 o'clock we'll have a, a study and pastor will continue ministering to us. For tonight, I wish you all a good night and safe travels back to our homes. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.